and welcome to the World Bank Treasury's uh, webinar series. This is, uh, this is an important topic that uh, we are going to uh, talk about, which is uh, buyback operations uh, done by the sovereign governments. Indeed, uh, buybacks are not some kind of you know, simple operations. It is not just buying back some securities from the market. It has different influences, of course, both on the uh, government's balance sheet and also on the, uh, in the investor's balance sheet. Uh, that's why it is so important to understand what can be the uh, impact of these operations uh, on, the, on the government side. And uh, these operations can be done uh, uh, on, on a periodic basis or uh, one-time uh, transactions. Uh, so, uh, of course, these two has uh, different uh, uh, outcomes, and also this can be done in uh, external market or local market. So again, uh, these two type of uh, buybacks are uh, different operations, and it will also have uh, different uh, impacts both in the uh, in the local market and also in the in the um, government's balance sheet. Uh, so uh, today, our uh, colleague uh, Antonio Valendia uh, will moderate the session. And he will first give a, a background about the buyback operations, the rationale of the buybacks. So I will just give floor to him. Uh, thank you so much, Antonio. Okay. Good morning, afternoon, night, everyone. Uh, as uh, Chosun um, explained, um, the buybacks are an integral part of the work that is done in the debt management office. Um, and buybacks are part of a broader liability management operations. Uh, their offices and, and sovereigns use these operations to restructure the portfolio. Uh, that can be used for, for changing the currency or the interest rate type or the maturity uh, profile of the portfolio. Um, what, what liability management operations, uh, what, what sort of operations do we, uh, uh, are we talking about? Buybacks, uh, essentially, which we will focus on today, but also exchanges, swaps, and sometimes and most of the time, I think these, these operations don't come uh, on, on their own. They are a package, and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about that, especially in the case of, uh, of Colombia. Uh, why, why countries do that? Why debt management offices do that? Uh, one, one of the main drivers for the, the rationale for these operations is the need that their offices have to meet their, their debt management strategy. Um, the, the strategy, as we know it, uh, provides pretty clear guidelines or should provide pretty clear guidelines in terms of refinancing risk, of interest rate risk, of on foreign currency risk. And these buybacks could help countries to, to move towards the type of composition that the, the, the strategy uh, recommends or suggests. Um, and, uh, and that can be done in a much, uh, in a much uh, faster way compared to countries that can only use their, their, their issuance. Uh, another, another uh, so we see, um, uh, we see a lot of countries in the external, in the domestic market doing, not waiting until the benchmark bonds uh, comes to maturity before they start refinancing. Uh, we'll, we'll, hear, uh, we'll hear the case of, of Colombia, but uh, I'm pretty sure the audience is is familiar with uh, with these cases. Uh, I I would say that the, in general countries start buying back the securities that are maturing at least with a with a one year ahead. Uh, so when securities when these uh, securities mature, um, probably probably at least half or more of that has already been bought back by by, by the sovereign. Um, we could, we've seen, uh, and in the case of Colombia as well, we've seen these buyback operations also used for changing the currency composition. Uh, not too long ago, I recall a case in which Colombia 
was raising funding in local currency, used those proceeds to buy back some of the foreign currency uh, securities. Another rationale that is, uh, that is common is the reduction of the, of the debt servicing cost. Um, could be the could be current uh, securities that are pretty liquid, uh, and an investor is not going to accept an illiquid security unless uh, the interest rate, the, the return of the securities, provide the, the the proper remuneration. So buying back some of these illiquid securities and replacing that by benchmark securities may may lower the funding cost. Uh, there are other other ways also to lower to to profit from distortions of the market, but buying back uh, securities that are that are expensive. Those are those are I would say the most common motivation for for sovereigns. Uh, but but we've seen other other interventions. I recall Hungary, uh, probably Brazil as well. Um, not too long ago, using these operations to keep the market functioning in times of turbulence, uh, where you lose the, the, the price signals, uh, buybacks could help uh, uh, reallocate liquidity between instruments and, and funding sources. Um, and, um, and this is an, another one which is less common probably between sovereigns, but I think I think for the for the bank perhaps is is more more useful is the buybacks that would help sovereigns uh, uh, sorry investors restructure their portfolio. So this is this is uh, this is a lot of uh, motives a lot of as, uh, going to why do um, issuers use these these operations? How about the how? Um, as Shoskun mentioned, there are there are different ways in which these buybacks could be executed. Uh, it could be over the counter, could be on a one-time uh, uh, case, on a over or over a certain period. Uh, could be bilateral. Uh, sovereigns could use a, a, an intermediary to do, to do that. Uh, Tenzing will tell us uh, more about the case of a, a sovereign that came to us uh, because they wanted to buy back a, a, a security in the international uh, capital markets, but they didn't want the noise and the, the, the market to know, uh, and then prices move against them. Uh, this, of course, is less, less transparent, but this is, this is a, a possibility. Uh, Sovereigns, as far as I, I know, I think these type of single buyback operations are not very common for sovereigns. They are more part of a package, a tender offer or switch tender offers in which the sovereigns are doing several things at the same time. Um, they, are, they are issuing, they are buying back. Uh, part by cash, but they are exchanging uh, the, the securities that are coming close to maturity. This is the case of Colombia. Uh, Camila will tell us about how they use uh, this operation in October to buy back $1 billion of the, of the dollar bonds that were maturing in 2019 and exchanging them for uh, $1 billion of 2029 um, maturity. Uh, this again in the in the in the external market. In the local markets, we can see um, also reverse auction on the on don normally on the multiple price. But this is something that we are not covering today. We can leave it for for later. What about the World Bank? The World Bank, contrary, I would say, contrary to most sovereigns. The World Bank doesn't conduct active liability management operation to handle refinancing risk the way sovereigns do. We do not. Uh, we do wait until the, the until the securities, the benchmark bonds, come to maturity. We have no problem with the liquidity that is needed for for uh, for the settlement of this operation. So it's not refinancing risk what drives us to do this operation. It's, uh, and, and this is what Bozena will tell us, 
the bank has funding that comes from other sources, other than the benchmark bonds. And the buyback operation have a role to support this funding program. So we will we will hear we will hear that in more detail. So um, so what we'll do right now is um, uh, I would like to start with the case of Colombia uh, by by Camila, who is the responsible for the uh, for the external funding for the for the Minister of Finance in Colombia. Uh, I think the, the audience have the details of the CV, right? Um, then, so I'm not going to, to go to the, to the bio details. Then we'll, we'll go to the one case in which the bank acted as an intermediary for another sovereign to carry out buybacks in the international uh, capital markets, which will be covered by, by Tenzing. And finally, uh, Bozena will tell us um, uh, about the buyback operation that the bank does as, as uh, part of the of the funding program and the, the internal operations that we do. So, without that, uh, with, with that uh, in mind, let me turn to Camila uh, to talk about the operation that was done last October. Camila, over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you. I'd like to show the presentation, but I'm not sure if if it's in there or, or if I can share it. Give me a minute. Hi, Camila. Oh, I think it's Hi. coming up. In case you have yeah. an issue, I have the presentation. We're seeing you. Just put it in the phone. Okay. Yep, this is great. Thank you. Thank Go ahead. You. Okay. So, as as Antonio mentioned, we, we did a buyback operation back in October of last year. So first I would like to start with our public debt strategy. We had a strategy that has different targets regarding fixed and variable rate, a local and external currency, and we try to publish this like every three or four years. So we make sure we are with, right, with the right indicators. In this case, we have one indicator that is what I'm showing you in, in the screen. It's the the limit that we will have that we would like to have every year uh, as a percentage of maturity. So if we look at the red line, the 15% means like means the um, the maximum percentage of maturity that we should have in each year. And the 10% is our ideal target. So we've been, like the, the graph shows that in the last years, we've been adjusting that. So every year we have less than 10% in our maturity. In the case of the transaction that I'm going to talk about, um, we, had a li we were just on the limit. We had 11% that year and now we just moved to 10%. So regarding the operation, the specific operation, here we have our 10-year benchmark and our 30-year benchmark. So that just to, to say that we were monitoring the markets and looking at the best timing for, for doing the operation. Here in the next, we have the, like the dual tranche. So first what we did was to said that we were going to issue a new 2029 bond and that we were going to buy back the outstanding uh, 2019 bond uh, up to a billion. So we opened the books, we started looking at the transaction. The 2019 bonds were trading at around 102 for price. And it was, as, as Antonio mentioned at the beginning, it was a switch tender. So we have a tender for switch and also tenders for cash. And at, at around 12 or 1, we close the books and then we see what, what we had and what would change. The first tranche, the 2029 bone, had a demand of up to $8 billion. So. On that time, we decided that we could reopen also the 2044 
bone. So we retapped that bone for 500 million because the operation had a good demand. And just to just to be more clear, I'm going to move to the next slide. Here we have all our external external bonds maturity profile, and also multilateral. So here we can see that in 2019 we have a little bit more than two billion, and part of it was the two billion that we had in the 2019 global bond. So we we bought that bond back, and then we issued the 2000. 29 bond. So that's the buyback operation. And then in the same transaction, we had new cash that is reflected in the gray bars. So we had 500 in the 2029 and the retap that I just mentioned, the 2044 retap also. Uh, well, the transaction had a really good bid to cover. As, as we can see, for the 2029 was four times oversubscribed, and for the 2045 was 3.3 oversubscribed. So that's that's the the basic of the operation. I will be happy to answer to answer some more questions. Just to mention that we are the last transaction like this that we did was back in 2012. So we try to follow our data strategy and look at the best market opportunities. Happy to answer any question, but I think we're, we're going to do that at the end, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Camila. I think that uh, that is a very succinct uh, story. Uh, I didn't know that there was no operation between 2012 and, and now. That's a, that's a long that's a long time. Uh, but let me let's say yeah let's come back to some of the some of the issues of that that operation in the end uh, we would like to see um, we would like to see we would like to see the uh, a little bit more of the details if possible I mean how did you uh, how did you go to the um, banks the selection of the banks. Uh, the choice of the of the 29 and the and the 40, 45, 44. Uh, but let's let's come back to you um, now. Let me go to Tenzing to talk about the the operation that the, the bank did for a sovereign that wanted to do a similar uh, a similar repurchase of a bond that was coming to maturity, but contrary to Colombia. They didn't want everybody to to know, and that wanted they they wanted to do kind of uh, quietly. So uh, over to you, Tenzing. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Antonio. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Tenzing, and uh, I'm here with uh, my colleague Bojena, and we are both uh, you know in the structured funding department of the World Bank's Treasury, and uh, because of the way we sit, uh, and because of the work that we do. Uh, for example, things like buybacks and, and, and structured bonds and so on and so forth, we are then also tasked with trying to see if we can use um, the work that we have and the experience that we have to, to maybe try to extend that and perform those uh, services for our clients. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's along those lines uh, that uh, way back in uh, 2007, 2008 era, uh, one of the programs we did was uh, was to execute buyback transactions on behalf of a client. Um, I don't have a presentation for you because um, because I don't want to you know have too much of this uh, client related information uh, being um, uh, disseminated too freely. Uh, but I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have, um, and I'll uh, I'll go into a little bit of the detail of that program. So uh, I think it's fair to say at this point, uh, because everybody in the market knew about it, uh, that Gabon had issued a bond in 2004 uh, that matured in two, uh, 2007, that matured in 2017. Uh, and uh, as part of uh, the, you know, the sales page as well as the presentation of that bond, uh, they had also mentioned that to show their uh, to essentially to show their creditworthiness uh, and their ability and willingness to pay back, uh, they would actually install uh, an investment management program at the World Bank, 
uh, which would be dedicated to the reduction of the principal that would be due on this bond. Right? So that was actually written up as a quote-unquote intention uh, in their prospectus. Um, so, uh, so, so in you know under that sort of uh, under the auspices of that kind of uh, setup, uh, we had then worked with them to set up an investment management account, which was really the money, uh, the account into which the monies that they put went, uh, and then from that account, uh, we were given the authority to direct monies in that account towards the repurchase of their bonds. Um, so uh, this was a fee for service that we provided on their behalf, and essentially uh, the idea was that we will do open market operations of, of, of buybacks of their bonds, and what that really means is, um, you know, we will buy back at clips that are available in the market, and we will come to the market and we will execute uh, to the best market efficiency. So this was not an alpha portfolio. We are not trying to beat any alpha. We are not trying to do a strategy of timing and so on and so forth. Uh, this is important because, as Antonio was saying, one of the key things about buybacks is your objective. If your objective is to make money, then there's a different kind of uh, strategy that you have to put in place. It also entails a different kind of risk. Mm -hmm. And then how you present it to other people in the organization, so on and so forth, is a different uh, setup, right? In this case, it was to do market operations of buybacks. Uh, and, and the idea is to try to perform them as quietly as possible and to try to achieve market price at the time that you're buying these bonds back. Okay. Um, <clears throat> obviously, uh, you know, in a, in a process like this, it is important to make sure uh, that there is a proper set of guidelines so that the people who are managing that transaction on your behalf are very clear about exactly what needs to be done and there isn't too much wiggle room and too much judgment which might take the client by surprise. So in our case, we needed to either buy back the bond or if we were not able to buy back the bond because of illiquidity, because of unavailability of those bonds, then we were also allowed to buy zeros of treasury strips that were maturing a little bit before, but not after the actual maturity of the bond itself, right? So the funds would come in, and uh, by the way, in the prospectus itself, they had indicated um, that they would put aside um, to the tune of about $50 million per year for this operation. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, so now we know what is the actual volume, we know what kind of securities are going to be, you know, uh, uh, available to be purchased by, by the executor of the, of the contract. Uh, there is next to nothing by way of uncertainty for the client itself. The only thing is, am I actually going to get back some bonds or am I going to sit with some treasury strips? But other than that, there was no wiggle room. And uh, so this was the process that we followed. Uh, a little bit of a word by way of impact. So the intention of this was, you know, because Gibbon was coming to the market for the first time, I believe, at that point, uh, they needed to make sure that, you know, and that, that investors felt, felt good about, about investing in them, and they needed to have a marker, a, an indication of their willingness and their credit strength and so on and so forth. And this actually did achieve that. So once the buyback process started, uh, we didn't hide it from the dealer banks that we were executing on behalf of Gabon, because you are actually supposed to tell them exactly what you're doing. We're not doing it on the behalf of IBRD's portfolio. So we told the dealer banks it is on behalf of Gabon, number one. Number two, each time the bond was bought back, we actually retired that bond, right? So, so in fact, that liability was no, the, the liability and the amount of the buyback no more existed, right? Mm -hmm. So those were two of the salient features. Now, uh, once the buyback program started, at that point, the dealers knew and were expecting that there would be buybacks, you know, which is a good thing because you want your investors to have some, some level of certainty and confidence in the process that you have, right? So much so that they can actually expect that you might be doing something, you know, of course, along the lines of responsible uh, behavior. Um, and, and, and the other thing was also that, you know, um, the rating agencies had also caught on to this, and they were, you know, looking at this and making sure that, you know, that monies were actually being put in and, and there were buyback activities and so on and so forth. 
And while you know, in our contract with them, we didn't have any specific um, stipulations as to talk with rating agencies and so on and so forth, but judiciously we made sure that you know, the rating agencies were responsibly informed uh, of, um, of what was going on. Right? And obviously uh, that helped uh, you know, in their outlook for the, for the bonds rating also. Uh, so I'm going to stop at that, uh, and I think uh, you know we can field questions afterwards. Uh, I'm going to look around at Antonio to see if there's anything else he wants me to say for now. Uh, otherwise, we can resume it. Antonio, what do you think? No, no, I think th I think that's fine. I will probably have a couple of questions in terms of uh, how big uh, the the amount was, but let's come to that uh, uh, then for the Q&A session. Uh, so those two cases are, are pretty clear. Uh, uh, ex explain a little bit how uh, these sovereigns come uh, to the to the market for buyback operation. Let's hear now uh, the the case of of, uh, of the World Bank. Uh, how how these uh, these buybacks uh, uh, fit with our funding, why do we do that if we are not so worried about the, the refinancing issue, which is the, the main driver for sovereigns? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Bojan Agiza here at the World Bank. Um, I'll talk about our IBRD program, uh, buyback program. Uh, our program has been uh, fully operational since uh, early 1990s. And uh, the program is an uh, integral part of our funding strategy. Uh, our buybacks uh, uh, contribute to long-term <coughs> sustainability of IBRD's access to uh, secondary, uh, to I'm sorry, to financial markets for funding that reflects our AAA rating. Uh, the main objective of our program uh, is. is to enhance um, branding of IBRD's uh, funding program by providing uh, liquidity backstop to investors. Um, buyback support uh, branding of IBRD funding in several ways. Uh, they in enhance attractiveness of our bonds. Uh, and I'll explain, uh, along with our large benchmarks, uh, IBRD issues uh, MTNs and uh, structured bonds, which uh, by nature are less liquid. Uh, our buyback uh, program aims to um, increase the liquidity of uh, these bonds in the secondary um, market and provide uh, assurance to investors uh, that in the absence of uh, uh, potential buyers uh, in the market, we will uh, be there for, uh, to repurchase these bonds. Uh, just to mention, in uh, 2008, uh, during the 2008-2009 financial crisis, we have uh, repurchased a, a wide variety of our bonds, and that also included uh, benchmarks. Uh, another uh, way uh, we enhance our funding program is uh, by promoting efficient prices, uh, pricing in the secondary market for bonds which are um, less um, liquid or uh, also for traditional bonds. Um, and we want to ensure that uh, these less liquid bonds are uh, uh, not uh, trading at uh, um, unreasonably wide spreads. Um, uh, our pricing is, based, is competitive based on the marginal cost of funding for newly issued benchmarks. Um, Another, uh, I, I said another way we support our uh, funding is uh, uh, the buybacks uh, support uh, directly our innovative uh, financing, uh, which has been the hallmark of uh, IBRD's uh, funding program. Uh, we introduce new products and uh, are a leader in, uh, in, in many ways. Um, however, these new uh, structures are uh, very illiquid, and to provide investors uh, with assurance and uh, with confidence uh, to uh, test these new products, uh, we um, assure uh, their exit strategy if, if need be. Um, 
there are also uh, special circumstances from time to time that we need to consider, uh, such as um, uh, portfolio managers uh, wanting to uh, liquidate large volume of IBRD bonds, uh, and uh, in these circumstances, we can uh, design special uh, deals to allow for that. Um, in general, I'll just describe our program in general. Um, we, our buybacks are uh, based on the reverse inquiry basis. Um, our primary dealers uh, and lien managers that issue our bonds are uh, responsibly, responsible for uh, providing secondary market liquidity. Uh, however, it's not always possible. Uh, in these cases, uh, we, they come to us and they uh, request pricing for uh, specific bonds. Um, when uh, we uh, provide pricing uh, and uh, we agree uh, that it's uh, operational, uh, we provide 24-hour mandate to, to dealers uh, to execute these buybacks uh, uh, on our behalf. Uh, there are inquiries uh, that we see on a daily basis, uh, and um, we are available to repurchase our bonds uh, continuously and consistently which is very important uh, to, in providing assurance to investors. Um, special uh, circumstances to consider in our case is uh, most of our uh, funding is hedged, uh, and hence we need to consider several mechanisms to uh, consider unwinding or offsetting our existing swaps. Um, uh, internally, we've uh, developed uh, guidelines and procedures uh, that uh, help us uh, determine um, which debt is eligible for repurchase, what a pricing uh, strategy we'll use, and how we'll set our pricing for uh, short-term and long-term uh, bonds. Um, uh, these guidelines also consider um, internal documentation, what the approval process is, uh, how we'll book the trades, and um, what the accounting implications will be. Um, in case of our exotic currencies uh, or non-deliverables, we also uh, pay special consideration to uh, the timing of the settlement and in which uh, uh, currency these uh, bonds will settle. Uh, just uh, to give you an overview of our... Yeah, so, before yes. we go to the, so before we go to the overview, <coughs> You know, and harking back to what uh, Antonio was saying, you know, guys, uh, there is the the what you're doing, the why you're doing, and the how you're doing it. And even though on the buyback side for IBRD, uh, the why is different, the what and the how are more or less mm -hmm. all going to be the same anyway, right? So unlike, you know, many other borrowers, we are a frequent borrower, number one, and we are probably out there the premium triple A kind of credit, right? Mm -hmm. So we do not have funding issues. I can go out there and announce today a, a benchmark and we'll probably be able to raise 10 billion tomorrow. That's not a problem for us, mm -hmm. right? Liquidity is not a problem for us. What we are trying to do with our funding program is reduce the cost of, fund, of financing mm -hmm. by doing MTNs, which are you know, much cheaper than our benchmark bonds, right? <clears throat> and to enhance the value of those MTNs, which are by definition illiquid, we provide this buyback. Mm -hmm. So our objective is quite different. Mm -hmm. But what it reinforces is our ability to buy back. Every time we talk to investors, we tell them about our ability to buy back. So as Bojana was alluding to earlier, it gives us an opportunity to tell our buyers, look, you know, in the time of the crisis, when everybody else was strapped for cash and could not issue anything, we were buying back tickets as large as $200 million each. Okay. Right? This is in the height of the crisis when nobody was able to issue. Okay. Why? Because we are AAA, because there is flight to quality, and when there is flight to quality, we are that quality. Right? And this is something that our buyback program accords us. Right? But you will see through what Bojana was saying, that the what is being done and how it's being done is going to be the same thing. So, for example, as, as Antonio was alluding to earlier, you will need to have an idea of why you're doing it yourselves. 
you will need to have some sense of guidelines. You will need to have consistency in how you're looking at going to be pricing all of this and what kind of format you're going to use for execution, right? So I just wanted to make sure that we, we, we tied this, yep. you know, to the rest of the presentation, right? Just one, one, yep. one point that I would like to have clarity for the audience now is, uh, is to explain this different funding source for the bank. I mean, on where the MTN and the, and the structure uh, bonds, uh, how is it different and why, why does the bank look into this? Uh, because I think for a, for a sovereign, this is very different. That's right. The sovereign will go through a, typically to a, to a, a benchmark bond or That's to right. a bond. You will have to look for the investors. That's right. But, uh, but how is the MTN and these other bonds different? Yeah. From that? So I think you know there are two or three things where uh, where you know the uh, the ability to issue these and, and the willingness to issue these MTNs comes on right. First is what is your governance set, set up? You know as a as a sovereign issuer there are lots of uh, hurdles for governance and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And unless your process is very transparent, mm -hmm. you know you may not be able to do certain things. Mm -hmm. Benchmarks are by definition the easiest to issue. Mm -hmm. They're also the most clean and most mm -hmm. uh, you know they don't happen very frequently. Mm -hmm. So the number of transactions, the frequency of transactions, the size of the transactions, all of them, all of these aspects bear themselves uh, more favorably towards uh, let's say benchmarks. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is sovereigns are also not very frequent issuers, mm -hmm. unless it is somebody like the U.S. Treasury. Mm -hmm. right? Most sovereigns are not that frequent mm -hmm. issuers. And therefore, the second consideration is, what kind of shop do you have mm -hmm. that issues these bonds? Mm -hmm. So for the World Bank, uh, you know, we are concerned about what kind of cost do we pass on to our borrowers. As a finance shop in the World Bank, what we do, we make available to our clients the cheapest cost of funding that is available mm -hmm. to them. So for us then, as part of the mandate, we need to try to reduce the cost of funding. To the extent that we can reduce the cost of funding by doing MTNs and structures, we try to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, so what is the difference between MTNs and structures? You know, by definition, MTNs and structures are much more bespoke than a benchmark mm -hmm. bond. So there are investors out there who are looking for a certain kind of exposure. Mm -hmm. Let us say that they think that uh, the price of gold is going to go up and they would like a bond which is linked to the, they would like an exposure that is linked to the price of gold going up. However, they may not necessarily be experts in gold. They may not necessarily have exposure, uh, settlement uh, require, you know, uh, qualifications in gold. They may not have option um, uh, relationships on derivatives with their, with their client, uh, with their bankers. So to mitigate all of those things, one way to do it is to have a bond whose payoff is linked to, linked to gold. Mm -hmm. Now, you can get that from a bond, but you can get it from a AAA issuer like us, or you can get it from you know, somebody who has more of a credit risk. But if you take it from more of a credit risk, what happens now is you're exposed not only to the price of gold, but you're also exposed to the credit. Mm -hmm. With us, you're basically exposed to the asset and uh, our our credit risk you know is very low number one number two our credit spread doesn't move around too much mm -hmm. right and therefore you have a much more mm -hmm. solid and clear exposure to gold mm -hmm. now in a situation like that they will come to us mm -hmm. so along those lines whether it's for different currencies or other asset classes yeah. you know as long as you know you have built a franchise out there and your bankers know this mm -hmm. then a lot of this business basically comes through reverse inquiries. Yeah, yeah. That's what a reverse inquiry is, and I think it was MTNs are medium term now that program, right? right? That's okay. right. Those are over to you. Sorry uh, for the long yes, parenthesis. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> so just to wrap up, I wanted to uh, provide you with some statistic of our buyback program. Uh, I looked at the data for over the last 10 years, and so on average, we've uh, our volume has been. Uh, 1.5 billion U.S. dollars. Uh, uh, on average, about 100 transactions, but it varied from 70 to 250 transactions uh, in the past 10 years. Uh, the average uh, trade size uh, is 15 million, but we've seen sizes of 200 and uh, 1 million uh, dollars as well. Um, we've, IBRD has issued uh, funding in over uh, bonds in over 50 currencies, so we 
we see on average, I would say, 10 to 15 currency uh, inquiries about 10 buybacks in 10 to 15 different currencies on the annual basis. So thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. Yeah. Um, thank you very much uh, for all speakers. Uh, now the floor is open for a Q&A, question and answers. Uh, please, uh, since we have um, multiple connections for the sound quality, we will mute your mic. So you need to use the chat function. Send your question to the host, Amira Ahmad, and we'll take your questions from our end. And so let me let me start with the one that. Uh, the one question that we receive, and I think this is for Camila. Um, the question is for sovereign considering buybacks and giving a choice, uh, meaning not uh, facing a refinancing challenge. How should the sovereign evaluate portfolio management issues versus the cost of buybacks? Uh, how do you, how do you guys in Colombia? Uh, take this factor of the cost of the buyback, uh, uh, the cost of the buyback operation. I think uh, I, I'm assuming the, the person that is asking uh, means that the, the buyback is expensive. Uh, in general, especially if people know that you're after your own securities, it's for sure that the, the prices will come up. Uh, so, so Camila, how do you how do you take into account these portfolio targets that you have versus the cost of these operations? Do you do, do you take them into account and, and and how? Sure, sure. Thank you. We, as you mentioned, yeah, I think that the answer is yes. We take into account the cost of the operation. What we do is that is that. We track our red, our bonds and we see the price that they are trading. Because, for example, right now I have a 2020 bone that is trading at the price of 110. So that, will, for me, I will consider and think twice because it's higher. But we do different things. So first, I would like to mention that the bone that we ball back the 2019 was issued back in 2009 so it was our 10-year benchmark for a long time and it had a coupon of 7.375 percent so we were paying a high coupon for that bond compared to the price that it had so we we paid a price of 102 and so we had to make a balance between of what we're paying at the price of the bond we know that it has fiscal implications for some countries and for us too because we have to pay that that premium to the market. But we what we do is like we monitor our bonds. We also budget uh, liability management operations and we try to get the best moment in the market because if I take at any time just to buy the bonds, I could pay a higher price for, for the operation. That, that's to answer, to answer the question. So the, I think the answer is yes, we, we take into account both, both of them. And of course, if, if we're not getting to the target and it's expensive, we have to consider and put in the balance both of them. So I want the target, but if it, it has a higher cost, um, we, we, we take a close look at those numbers. Also, I, I would like to, to, to say something that, that you asked, why we, we choose the 2029 and then the 2045. So the, the main reason that we decided to do a 2029 was that we didn't have um, a new 10-year benchmark. We, did, we had a 2027 that was our, our benchmark, and it was already October 2018. So what we did is to give the market a new 10-year 10 10-year 10 benchmark, and then just stop our 30-year because to make a new benchmark for that small size is not will, wouldn't be a liquid point in our curve. Okay, Camila. One more, one more that's coming from another, from Andre, uh, uh, another colleague here. Is why how how long did the October 18 operation lasted, 
And uh, what did you do to protect uh, against intraday movements on treasury movements? Okay, so first uh, we announced the on timing. We announced the operation. As I said, the the, the liability management operation, the switch was closed at 20 or 1, like the accounts that were want to give the room back. And then it has a closing of, of T plus three, but the the insurance part had a closing had a closing of T plus five. So during those days, the risk was managed by banks by the banks that we hire for the insurance. Okay, okay. Uh, can you talk about the criteria to announce the operation? The timing, the timing was very precise. Uh, which criteria did you choose to announce the operation? Uh, you, you mean in, term, in terms of market, we always monitor our, well, first the treasuries, our spread, the CDS, and we also monitor, take a really close monitor to, to the news. And it, this transaction opened the last time sovereign market in October because it was a long time that there was no sovereign issue in, in the market. So we take a close look also at CDS that it, it was it was in the presentation previously. And basically what we do is take into account all the indicators treasuries, our spreads, and also important news that could impact the market. Okay, Camila, thank you. Thank you very much. Tenzing, uh, on, this, uh, on this operation on behalf of Gabon, uh, looking, back, looking back, how did we do, how much did we buy, I mean, from the, the, of course, there was the alternative of buying um, treasury strips, but how much did we able to get in compared to the what was in the stock? Uh, maybe before that, how did you find the holders of the bonds? Uh, how did you do the sure. intelligence process to to get the the, the securities? Sure. Um, with respect to the actual transaction amounts, I think uh, it starts to get into the realm of uh, client information. Okay. Uh, but uh, let me give you what is publicly available. And what is publicly available is that they had represented that they are going to fund this account by about $50 million every year. Yeah. So that is publicly available and you can, you know, think. Uh, by and large, uh, especially when a bond is part of a, a global index, as this Gabon bond was, mm -hmm. you know, as part of the emerging market index. Okay. What happens then is, you know, across the universe, all kinds of investors start to buy small bits of that bond in order to replicate the index. At that point then, um, what happens is liquidity, of course, dries up, you know, and there's not, there's not too many people actually looking to sell. So it does become an exercise in making sure that you have uh, a good and wide enough network of dealers uh, and, and pointed dealers, because not everybody under the sun is going to be able to service that uh, requirement, but you really want to do some homework and, and some legwork in trying to make sure that you've been around to enough uh, uh, dealers to try to figure out if they have these bonds or not and roughly what kind of volume or, or they either have or have access to. Mm -hmm. So access to meaning um, that they have in their client list you know, people, you know, investors who actually have these bonds, right? There's also a constant monitoring then of uh, the activity on Bloomberg. Uh, you know, if you do all Q, you'll you'll get a sense of you know who's trying to sell, who's who's not selling. But it's not the most informative information in the sense of it's not the most accurate information. But you know, at certain points, you're really looking for even which way is north. Mm -hmm. You know. And so if the compass is pointing in a certain direction, you take that as you know, one of your inputs. So it was you know, a little bit of a challenge to try to, uh, to try to source those bonds sometimes. And I can say this without divulging too much information, simply because you can put two and two together, which is one is that it's only a $1 billion bond, and second is that if it's part of a global index mm -hmm. of some sort, right? Then it's very easy for anyone to say that, oh, in that case, you know, a lot of these mm -hmm. bonds will actually be held by investors. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, 
without uh, you know being too cute, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the predominant amount of the money that we got, we were able to buy the bonds back. Okay. Do do we do we contact the uh, the bank or the, the lead manager of the original? Yes, uh, we do. We do. Yeah, absolutely. And there is no problem with that. Uh, There's no problem with contacting the lead managers. It's easy to see on the prospectus who they were. Um, and you know that would that would be your first uh, point of contact, okay. right? Okay. Um, going to the to the Bosena to the these operations of the bank, uh, I I found the the operation a bit complex in terms of ALM because, as you were saying, uh, when you're buying back some of these securities, these the securities were on the other side of the balance sheet funding some other operation. There could be there could be already uh, swaps that are tied. Uh, we essentially are a U.S. dollar funding institution, so if it is another currency, uh, then then we're talking about the swap and so. So it must be a bit of a of a headache to <laughs> to one um, to do all this. So Tenzing and I can comment on it. Uh, so in, in general, we have our guidelines that tell us uh, uh, how to solve these issues. Uh, if uh, in cases when um, uh, when there are um, liquidity swaps into other major currencies, we would provide a bid in this, uh, let's say, euro currency. Um, but uh, we also have some of our bonds on the list. Uh, that we cannot repurchase for exactly these reasons. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but you know, let's take a step back yeah. though, right? Um, so Antonio, you're absolutely right. And just so that everybody else knows, uh, for the most part, all of our bonds that we do come with, as you alluded to, a hedging swap, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how we manage our ALM. Everything on the asset side is brought back into six month dollar LIBOR, roughly. And everything on the liability side is also brought back into six month dollar LIBOR, mm -hmm. right? So when we do our buybacks, we do it so that it's asset liability management neutral. Mm -hmm. in, other, in, the, in that sense, what we, are, what we are really buying back then is we are buying back on an asset swap basis. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if we are going to do a buyback, we will also then do the unwinding swap. Mm -hmm. And the price of the bond has to take into account the unwinding. Okay. Okay. Um, let, me, let me stop there to see if the panelists of uh, Choskun, if anybody on, around the table, Camila, if you have any other comments to, to make. Um, otherwise, I will, I will uh, try and summarize a few uh, bullet points that I had from these, uh, from these exercises. Um, uh, any other, any additional, any further comment, Camila? On your side? No, no from no from my side. Thank you. Okay. So, can I ask a question to my distinguished Colombian colleagues? That's Camila. That's Camila. And, and Antonio. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Antonio had mentioned uh, that you know sometimes sovereigns do buybacks also to reduce their cost of funding, right? So, uh, you know, obviously, even if you are reducing your cost of funding, you are still paying economic value, right? For for whatever it is, you know. So that bond, you know, just because interest rates are in a lower interest rate environment, now that bond is actually more expensive, and so you are paying money upfront, but to reduce the uh, the actual interest that is going to be paid in future future years. So economically, it's the same thing. So at that point, when you are doing this for quote unquote cost reduction purposes, right? What is the uh, analysis? What is the thinking? What are the objectives that you are trying to achieve? I let you go first, uh, Camilla, and then I'll, I'll come back <laughs> so that I'm hedged. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you mean the objectives in time of in in terms of cost? Cost savings. Yeah. Cost savings. Okay. Okay. So we we do a complete analysis that you mentioned of the coupon, but we also know that we have to pay a premium upfront at the moment. In this case, we also had the 2019 amortization in this year. So that gave us more space for funding. So that was also an important consideration that, that, that we had. Since we paid back or we, 
we we refinanced one billion that we had to pay this year that give us more space in the user side. And in, in terms of net cost, what we do is look at both the coupons, but also at the upfront that we're paying. So the impact, we know there has a, it has an impact and we have to pay an upfront, but we take into consideration like all, all the variables. Yeah, yeah. yeah let, me, let me add to that the, the point that you're making I mean, if a, if a debt manager goes after high coupon uh, bonds to replace them for low coupon bonds, uh, there is absolutely, from economic point of view, no savings whatsoever. But this may be this may be very important from for the for the budget, mm -hmm. which is the way you account for the for the coupons is different from the from the debt, let's say. Uh, the debt may increase, and economically uh, it's going to be the same, but you open a space yeah. for the for the brim. There is no savings as such uh, from from the economic yeah. point of view in that that operation. But but I think that, that there are there are other there are other operations that actually actually uh, do uh, result in a in a in a, in savings. Uh, when you buy a very liquid security and then and then you issue a benchmark bond, uh, the benchmark has a, a much more liquidity, and I'm talking especially about the the local markets. Uh, that's for sure that you will have. This is a win-win situation. There is a there is a uh, the debt managers issue a lot of securities. Not all these portfolios are well planned. There are securities of, uh, of small sizes, and uh, and you can you can get uh, you can get them back at a very at a very relatively low price. But the the game, the play that they do in terms of the of the current payments and future payments, yes, from economic point, there are people doing also the opposite, mm -hmm. like buying by like uh, like reducing the debt stock. Like buying back uh, that, that is uh, expensive mm -hmm. without economic change, but just uh, the, the, what is what you want to to show, yeah. and it's playing a little bit with the flows and the stocks, without any economic saving uh, as such. So it's more I fiscal consideration. Is it, is it that that could be fiscal, but uh, but I think I think the the main emphasis, especially in the local market, is the liquidity aspect. I think that the the for for sovereigns for the managers. What is absolutely critical is the size of the issuance, because that is what will give the possibility of going to the indices or to, or to trade those securities more frequently. They are used as collateral uh, more frequently. They are very demand, high demand, and then that that liquidity premium tra translates into a higher price, into a lower cost of funding for the. So, so the issuance program, the the liability management operations, may a lot of them may be may be is that angle that that, that countries would uh, would look for. Okay, let me let me stop uh, there um, and let me uh, recap on a four or five uh, um, uh, comments that I that I wrote down while I was listening to the panelists. Um, I'd like to come back to, the, to Camila's point first and uh, to highlight the importance of the management strategies for the sovereigns. I think the, the, the buybacks should be part or should be driven uh, as, as far as possible by the, by the strategy that the sovereign has. And that strategy is always expressed in terms of, of uh, exposure to, to risk. Uh, so what Camila showed us uh, was shows very clearly that there were there were a lot of uh, of uh, debt that was maturing on 2019 and the and the refinancing risk was addressed uh, by by this operation that was uh, taking place in in October refinancing and I'm not familiar with the the, the situation of Gabon is back in 20, uh, 2004. But uh, but it's clearly related to the refinancing, uh, to the need of refinancing a eurobond, 
and I think the 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 what uh, what is being told by by Tenzing shows clearly that the, there was a success in terms of of reducing the the amount that had to be had to be refinanced. Um, I think the, the the other issue uh, that I, especially for for sovereigns on the external market is that you will see more this tender for switch and tender for cash rather than the isolated buyback operations. I found that the the case of, of Gabon is rather uh, is rather unique. I don't see very that uh, done very often, but I gather that we could offer that to our client countries if they want to go to use that, that avenue. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk much, and we probably would uh, leave this for the, for the future, are the risks of these operations. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think for the case of, of Colombia, for instance, uh, if you schedule this operation and you don't, uh, and the bid to cover is too low or there is very little interest, I think there is a there is a reputation, a reputational problem. And if you didn't manage to get uh, the 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 back the the securities that you wanted, that means that the refinancing problem will, will still be be there. Um, that that uh, I think we didn't address in this in this webinar, but could be we could come back to that. Um, Bozena mentioned accounting, and actually that's a very interesting issue that we came across in the in West Africa. Uh, we were we were talking about the possibility of using repos for the investment of excess liquidity of the sovereign. So they would, if they would have, if they have been accumulating excess cash balances with the central bank, they would, they would auction this to the banks as a repo, meaning they will get back as collateral their their own securities. The problem with that is uh, is that uh, I think as in the case of Gabon, uh, by law, once you buy back those securities, those securities disappear. Right. They are cancelled. Uh, so we cannot do that until there is a legal uh, modification that allow that security to remain alive. Let's say uh, there could be, and an, uh, this discussion on the on the uh, deficit and the debt and the playing with the numbers of the accounting is also is also something that we didn't uh, we didn't deal with. Probably we will have the chance to do it uh, more in a, in a in another opportunity, where we could focus probably more on the on the part of the local market. So with that, uh, with that, let me let me thank uh, uh, the panelists. Let me thank Camila, especially because she was conducting an operation yesterday in New York. Uh, I hope it went well. Uh, so it was it was a stretch to have you early in the morning. Thanks very much for all this effort, Camila, and for bearing with us uh, with all the pressure to to get you on time. Uh, thank you, Ozena, for the for the presentation on the on the internal bank operations. I think I think this is interesting because it's very different from the business that we do. But as Tenzing uh, reminded us, I think the the Motivation could be different, but a lot of the infrastructure, the main guidelines in which these operations are done, should be the, should be very similar to what sovereigns do. And thanks, Tenzing, for the presentation on Gabon and all the experience that the bank has had intermediating these uh, these operations. With that, I would like to to thank uh, all the audience for being here. And let's hope to have a, another opportunity to continue this conversation uh, more on the on the local markets. Thank you very much. Any last words? Thank you, no? yeah. Thank Thank you, you Antonio. Our pleasure to be to be here with you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for your time. I'll be sharing with you the slides that we presented today, along with the recording session. If you had any com um, technical issue that missed some part of the recording, and a short survey. And thank you, and I will see you again.